Good evening and welcome to Southern Hills this evening. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors tonight. Um, I do hope you had a chance to pick up one of our orange uh, announcement pages tonight. It's got a lot of information concerning the second shut-in and a lot of uh, activities going on here at Southern Hills this summer. Uh, just to cover those, Jane Brown is recovering at home from her recent heart surgery or heart procedure. Uh, she would like to be remembered in our prayers and she does enjoy calls and visits from us um, whenever we're able to get by her house. Also, David Carruthers, as many of us know, remains in the ICU at Murray Regional. Uh, we want to continue to remember David as he's uh, sedated right now, but also remember Shannon and Mora as they're taking care of him um, in our prayers. Also, Stoney Warren is in NHC Place in Cool Springs. His room number is on the announcement page, but there's also a special note that due to dialysis, the best days to visit Stoney and Donna are Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I know they appreciate our, our visits as we come by, but those are the best days to uh, stop by and see, see them. Um, Connor Green, Dave and Jean Sweeney's grandson, had an accident at church camp. I believe it was yesterday. Um, he was at, in surgery this morning for a broken ankle at Vanderbilt's Children's Hospital, but I understand the surgery went well and he's actually now at home resting, so we're glad to hear that. Also, Jim Duty's test went well yesterday, and he is scheduled for another exam on September, the, uh, September 10th at, uh, at Vanderbilt. And as you'll notice on the back of the announcement page, our summer series continues tonight with Sellers Crane. Um, he's from the Rivergate Congregation, and his topic this evening is the joy of heaven. He'll be extending our invitation at the appropriate time and then at the class time he'll be here in the auditorium. Uh, our 6th through 12th grade will be listening to David Broom tonight um, and that will be back in the fellowship hall. Uh, summer Youth Series continues tomorrow evening. We'll be going to Creve Hall and that's for the rising 5th graders um, up to the 12th graders. Plan to leave here the building at about 6.15 tomorrow evening. Um, also our fellowship and fireworks is coming up Thursday, July the 4th. Uh, beginning at 7 p.m. there will be a barbecue dinner provided here so we are asking that if you're planning to come if you would email the church uh, church office or let me or Katie know so we can make sure that we have enough food and everything for everyone there uh, so we're looking for a good time uh, July the 4th um, and then one special note that was handed to me uh, that needs to be added to our second shut-in list is Dan and Linda's son-in-law uh, Bruce Fry's twin brother Brent Fry, he has been diagnosed with APL, which is uh, a form of leukemia, and this is an aggressive type of leukemia. Uh, treatment will start as soon as possible with uh, arsenic, and he will be in the hospital for at least 28 days uh, due to those uh, treatments. So we want to remember uh, Brent Fry in our prayers as we go throughout our days. Uh, those are the announcements that I have. If you would, bow with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day you've blessed us with. We're thankful for all the opportunities to spread your gospel. We pray that, that we have taken advantage of those and we have to spread your gospel and let those know of your word as we, we go throughout our, our work days. Father, we pray that you be with each one of us as we go into the service. Help everything done, said and done, be done in accordance with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll be a friend to Jesus, number 312. <clears throat> Today tried my Lord and Master with no one to defend within the hall of Pilate. He stood without
celebration song tonight, if you're using our book, will be number 667 for our opening prayer message tonight. Number 581, Sing On, 581. <clears throat> Sing on, ye joyful Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have woken us up to, to enjoy, to recognize you as the creator of all things. We look around and we see the awesomeness of your creation, and we're just grateful to be able to experience the beauty that is surrounded us. Father, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for all the blessings that you give to us each and every day. We're grateful for our church family here and for the opportunity that we have to come here in the middle of the week to pause and take time to study and to sing praises to your name. We pray, Father, that you will strengthen us each and every day and help us to, on a daily basis, look to you and to study and to gain strength from the teachings of your word. We're grateful for 
the eldership here at Southern Hills. We pray that you will bless them with wisdom as they continue to guide this church family. We pray that you will help the efforts that are being made to find a man to stand in this pulpit to be our minister. We pray, Father, that the efforts that are being made will be ones that will seek a man that will speak the truth and to speak boldly your word. We pray, Father, for those that have been mentioned this evening that are part of our church family here that are struggling, that have been involved in accidents or have illnesses that are affecting their bodies. We pray that the blessings that will be given to them will be successful in a way that will help them to regain their strength. And most of all, Father, that no matter what they're going through, that their faith in you will remain strong. We pray, Father, for those who are traveling uh, during the summertime. We pray that you'll give them safe travels. We pray, Father, that you will be with those who are teaching your word throughout the world, that you will successfully give them the measure of wisdom that they need to teach your truth in a way that hearts will be touched and others will be brought to you. We thank you, Father, most of all for loving us and for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we walk this life on this earth, that we will keep our focus on heaven, that we will have the strength to always look to you for guidance. We pray, Father, that you will help us when we're struggling and when we're weak. Help us, Father, to always keep our focus on you and to do and say those things that will be pleasing in your sight. We're grateful for this hour of study tonight with Brother Crane. We pray that you will help our ears to be attentive to the words that he speaks from your word so that we can be stronger students of yours. Father, we love you and we thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe coming here that made me start thinking about time. I was telling some of the brethren in the back, the first time I ever spoke for Southern Hills, we were still meeting in the little white building back there. So that was quite a while ago. I was also talking about how long it has been since Danny Cottrell and I met. And I know I met him sometime in the late 1960s when he was holding a gospel meeting in Waynesboro, Tennessee, and we've been friends ever since. But when you think about time, people have told me for years, the older you get, the faster time flies. I didn't really understand that when I was a young person, but I understand that now, how quickly time can fly. A familiar passage to us is found in Romans 90 and verse 10 which says the days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they're four score, yet as our strength, labor, and sorrow, we're soon cut off and we fly away. I was looking at something that was sent to me today. A 101-year-old lady, and she had a 1930-something Packard. And I mean that Packard was a beautiful automobile. I would like to have had it myself. But she was 101 years old, and she took the people on a drive who were filming this in her Packard, and when she got back, she was asked the question, have you lived here all of your life? And she said, not yet. <laughs> she was 101, but she said, not yet. I had an uncle who died last year, and he was 101 years old. And when you sat down and talked to him, his mind was clear. He could talk to you about all kinds of things. But I'm sure, because I've asked him that question when he was living, that his life flew by. He did not realize, you know, how short life really was. Life is short. And that's why the psalmist went on to tell us, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It doesn't matter what age we are, that's something we need to do. 
And the wisdom that we need to apply to our lives is the wisdom that comes from this book, the Word of God. And we need to make preparation for that inevitable journey that all of us are going to make one day. And don't take for granted that we have forever to make that decision, because we may not. If you're here tonight, you're not a Christian, and you understand what you need to do in order to be saved, that is to believe in Jesus, to be the Son of God and your Savior. And because of that, to be willing to repent of past sins, confess faith in Him, be buried with Him in baptism. And Scripture tells us His blood will wash away all of our sins. If you haven't done that, you need to. If you're one who has done that, for whatever reason, you feel like you've fallen away or you're not living the way you ought to live or you have something in your life that's troubling you and you want the prayers of your brothers and sisters, I know they're here and ready to do that. Whatever your need is, if you'll only come as we stand and see you. for a treat. We appreciate you being here, Brother Crane. Our final song this evening before we dismiss to our classes is going to be number 839, When All of God's Singers Get Home. 839. <clears throat> what a song of delight in that city so bright will be wafted in the heaven's fair door. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, where never a sorrow or heartache will come, there'll be no Sin, hallelujah, amen. We'll be heard in that land or the foam. Every heart will be light and each face will be bright when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, where never a sorrow. Oh, great and merciful Father, we come before your throne this evening. 
glorifying your name, Lord, through song, through open up your word and be able to learn more about you. Lord, we know that our life is delicate and we're not promised tomorrow and we have no idea when our final day on this earth may be. And I pray that each of us can study your word each and every day and know how we should live and live in a way that whenever our time on this earth comes to an end we can come home to you Lord and be able to spend eternity with you singing praises to your name and magnifying your name we pray as we enter into class tonight we all have open hearts and be able to learn more and more about you and the plan you have for us take out the things that are outside of these walls that may be on our mind just be able to focus on you and you only Lord we pray for safety as we leave here tonight we pray for all those that were mentioned by name and those that are maybe on the hearts of those here we thank you most of all for your son it's in his name we pray amen Good evening. They told me you were ready when I was ready, so I'm ready. In a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip, Hobbes said, what if there is no afterlife? Supposing this is all we get. And that was Calvin who said that. Hobbes answered, what the heck? I'll take it anyway. And then Calvin responded, yeah, but if we aren't going to be rewarded for the way we behave in this world, I'd like to know it now. Obviously, a whole lot of people would agree with Calvin. There was a poll that was taken 
that said 89% of the people said they believed in heaven and they believed that they were going there. But what if there is no heaven? Have you ever really thought about what if there is no heaven? If heaven does not exist, it would mean that when we die, that we would cease to exist. Now here's another question for you. If you haven't tried this, try it sometime. Try to think of a time when you will never exist. Just see how difficult that can be for most of us. Think of a time when you will never exist. If we do not have a soul that lives beyond this world, it would mean that when we die, the grave is our final resting place. It means that our bodies will lie there in that grave to decay with no hope of resurrection. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, we call that the resurrection chapter. He said in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I think you can understand why he would say that. Since we're Christians and we believe there is a heaven, we believe there's something better than this world to look forward to. He also went on to tell us back in verse 18 of that same chapter that if there is no resurrection of the dead, that means that our loved ones who have died in the Lord, who went to their deaths believing in heaven, believing in life hereafter, that their bodies are going to remain in the grave with no hope of a resurrection. You know, it was back last year sometime when they had a rebroadcast of a program, uh, one of Barbara Walters' programs, and she entitled that program, Heaven, Is There Such a Place? And on that program, she interviewed several people, and the first of those was the Dalai Lama. And then she interviewed a Muslim, imprisoned Muslim terrorist. And then she interviewed some atheists. And also, she did include a few Christian believers in those interviews. But will somebody please tell me something? What does a Buddhist spiritual leader who doesn't even believe in the God of the Bible or a Muslim terrorist who does not believe in Jehovah God or an atheist, what do they have to add to this discussion about whether or not there is a heaven? Maybe if we understand a little bit more about Barbara Walters and her convictions, it might help because she was asked if she believed there was a heaven. She paused for a few moments as if stumbling to try to think of the exact words to say, and then she said, I am sure it is comforting to those who believe it. You know, the folks like her and others that hold similar beliefs think that you and I believe in heaven just because we need to. But I don't agree with that at all. We believe in heaven because we know it exists. We believe in heaven because we know there's more than sufficient evidence in God's inspired word to prove to us that heaven does exist. But where in the world is heaven? A little boy was asked that question and he said, well, you just go up to the North Pole and then you go straight up. Well, he was right about one thing, because any time we read in the Bible about heaven where location is mentioned, heaven is always up and hell is always down. In Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15, speaking for God, Isaiah said, the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, his name is holy, and he said, I dwell in the high and the holy place. Revelation chapter four, John was standing, gazing up into heaven, 
and he saw a door open. And there was an angel there who said to him, come up here and I will show you things that must come to pass hereafter. That beautiful passage in John 14, so comforting to us, especially in times of loss of loved ones. Jesus was informing his disciples that after he was raised from the dead, he told them he was going to die, but after he was raised from the dead, he was going to go back to his father's house. And there he would be preparing a place for them and for us. In Acts chapter 1, and it begins about verse 9, the Lord is standing on the Mount of Olives, and it was before he ascended back into heaven. Eleven of the apostles were with him. And the scripture says that as they stood with him, they beheld him as he was taken up into heaven, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And the angels that appeared after that told them, why do you stand here gazing? For that same Jesus who is taken up from you shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, and you have to read the text closely because you would think in the beginning he's talking about someone else. But if you analyze the text, you'll see he's talking about himself. And he said he was taken up into the third heaven. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. The second is the stratospheric heaven. The third is the habitation of God. It's the place where God lives. You know, there are some today who are teaching that heaven is going to be down here on a restored or renewed earth. That's not a new doctrine, folks. Our Jehovah's Witness friends have taught that for years. They have gone to Revelation chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 14, and they say, well, we're going to be 144,000 in heaven, and all the rest of us are going to be down here on earth. And that's essentially, they're talking about a renewed or restored earth. That's essentially the same thing that's being taught by some today. But I told a friend of mine just uh, last week who is one that believes this doctrine about heaven's going to be down here on earth. And I said, I can't get around 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. And if you read that passage, you're going to find out that Peter says that the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. He also said the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. And he went on to say that those things are going to be dissolved. Seeing though that, that these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of people ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1, and it actually begins with verse 7, says, You who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven in flaming fire with his mighty angels taking vengeance on them who know not God and who obey not the gospel. Paul also tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, Christ is not coming back to this earth. We're going to be called up to meet him in the air. And the scripture says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just another passage that ensures us that heaven is not going to be down here on earth. There's not going to be anything left here to renovate. Not going to be anything left here to restore if what we take what Peter says to be the truth. But what will heaven be like? You know, I mentioned that uh, poll that was taken earlier. And in that same poll, 85% believe that heaven will be totally different than the life we have down here. And I responded to that saying, I sure hope so. I sure hope it's going to be a lot different than the life we have down here. 93% said they believe angels are going to be there. 43% said they believe that we would have halos. 
and 36% said they believe we'll have hearts. Now, I'm going to have to pause there for just a moment to correct something. Because obviously, people who made those statements believe that when we leave this earth, we're going to be angels in heaven. And folks, that's not going to happen. We're not going to be angels in heaven. Angels were a specially created being. God created in the very beginning to be his servants. We're going to be who we are. We're going to have spiritual bodies, but we're going to be who we are in that world to come. Jeffrey Burton Russell, in an article entitled, Does Heaven Exist?, talked about what some people believe about heaven. And he said, it is this place where you've got wings, where you stand on a cloud, and if the concept is more sophisticated, it's where you see God and you sing hymns to him. It is a boring place or a silly place or something people have invented to make themselves feel better or all of the above. And then he went on to say what he believed in contrast to that, and he said, heaven is not dull. It is not static. It is not monochrome. It is an endless dynamic of joy in which one is evermore oneself as one was meant to be. John describes heaven for us. If you want to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22, I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 and going down through verse 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants will serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their forehead. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. What makes heaven so beautiful? I would suggest to you, first of all, that heaven is a real place. It's not an imaginary place like the Emerald City of Oz. It's not an imaginary place like Alice in Wonderland's place where she arrived when she fell into that hole. It is a real place. John tells us in his description, it is a place in chapter 21, beginning at verse 1, it is a place far removed from pain, from sickness, from death, from sorrow, from heartache, and taxes. I thought I'd throw that in. It is a place he describes in verse 4 of chapter 21 of Revelation as a place of perpetual joy because he says there will be no more tears for the former things have passed away. But how do you describe paradise? I know we all believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. We believe that. And so we know that whatever John's telling us in the Revelation is true. But he's putting it in the best words that he possibly can. Describing something that is indescribable. And I think we have to keep that in mind. Heaven is going to be more beautiful than we could ever imagine. I heard this story years ago, and I think it was from Brother Baxter Barry Baxter. But he told a story about a little girl who was born, and shortly after her birth, she was blinded. And she went through most of her life blind. She would go out walking with her father, and he would describe the beauties of nature and the world around them. 
but later she was able to have her sight restored. And the first time they went on a walk after that, she said, why didn't you tell me how beautiful everything is? In 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 7, we're told that the Queen of the South came up to see the glories of Solomon's court. And once she had seen it, she said, the half has not yet been told me. The Apostle Paul wrote, I have not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. I'll have to tell you something, that was said about the Word of God. But I believe that statement could also apply to heaven because I think heaven is far more beautiful than we could ever imagine. Heaven is God's Word for home. I was told this story to be a true story that took place during the Revolutionary War, the, the Civil War, here in Tennessee somewhere. And it was said that both armies were encamped across from each other, and as night began to fall, the northern band struck up Battle Hymn of the Republic. And the soldiers began to sing as loud as they could, louder and louder. And then those on the southern side, the band struck up playing Dixie. And their soldiers began to sing loud and louder. But then one soldier, homesick soldier, started singing home sweet home. And soon both sides were singing together. Heaven is God's word for home. Heaven is beautiful because of people. Revelation 22, we looked at a moment ago, tells us that God himself is going to be there. He's going to be our God. We're going to be his people. Jesus told us in that little example prayer in Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, that God is our Father in heaven. I want you to notice that because he often said, my Father in heaven. But teaching us that prayer of example, you go to Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, you'll see it was him teaching us to pray, and he's telling us that God is our Father in heaven. I know we all try to have an intimate relationship with God. Children of God as Christians, we want that intimate relationship with God. But he seems so far away. He seems so unreachable. But it won't be that way in heaven. He'll be there with us. We'll be there with him. Some of you may have heard of or even heard G.P. Hope. He's an outstanding black brother. And uh, had a big church up in Indianapolis. Spoke a lot in white congregations all over the place. And he was sitting talking to his daughter about heaven. And she said to him that she wasn't impressed with the golden streets, the gates of, of gold, or the gates of pearl, and the walls of precious stones. And he said, all of a sudden, I began to ask within myself, what have I done? Where have I gone wrong? She doesn't want to go to heaven. And then she said that it was not those things that she was impressed with, but it was the people who were going to be there that made heaven wonderful to her. Are we so steeped in this world's materialism that we're more concerned about heaven's gold than we are heaven's God? We also notice Jesus Christ is going to be there. Revelation 22 and verse 3. That one who loved us more than we love ourselves. He said in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down to myself. I have this power to lay it down and to take it up again. This command have I from the Father. Paul tells us in Romans 5 and verse 8, 
God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus didn't die for his friends. He died for those who were not his friends so that we might be his friends because of the death that he lived and died. The life that he lived and death he died for us. I'm sure that Scripture says, and this is 1 Corinthians 15 at verse 19 when he says we are of all men most miserable. He goes on to say, we don't have a reason to be miserable because now is Christ risen from the dead and he has become the first fruits of those that sleep. John tells us, 1 John 3 and it begins with verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And then he said, Beloved, now we are the children of God. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall be revealed, we know we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in them, keep your life pure even as he is pure. Not only will God be there, not only will Christ be there, but all the saved people will be there. That Heaven's Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, you think about some of those people. They're going to be there. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, that the time would come when some would sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the kingdom. One version says the kingdom of heaven. You know, when I think about that passage, it reminds me of something. It is one of those texts that prove to us that we will know each other in heaven. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Brother Charles Hodge said that when he died, he said, I'll still be me. And then he said, Hodge will be Hodge in eternity. And that is true of each one of us. We're going to be who we are. We might worry about, you know, what kind of body we're going to have. Paul didn't even understand that for sure. In 1 Corinthians 15, he discussed that. A lot of kinds of bodies, but it's going to be a spiritual body. But you know, there are more ways to recognize someone than just sight. If you know a sightless person, you know that is true because they have excellent ways of understanding and knowing people without being able to see. So we'll be able to see and know and love our loved ones that we've known in this world in heaven. Brother Marshall Keeble said, if I'm going to lose my mind when I get there, I couldn't enjoy it. And I agree with him. If we're going to lose our minds when we go to heaven, then what's value of being there. The value of being there is knowing that we lived this life and we lived it suitable to God's requirement and we were able to go home to heaven to be with our loved ones who've gone before. I mentioned that poll earlier and I've already mentioned it twice, but 79% said they believed that they would be able to see Peter. I wonder why. They said he's a gatekeeper. You know. Be able to see Peter and also some of the other biblical notables like Paul but they also said they would be able to see friends and loved ones who have gone before who have died in the Lord. And I believe the same thing. This piece was written by an unknown author. I don't know who he is, or if it's a sheet, it could be, but it sounds like a man wrote it. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a man. He said, when I was a boy, I used to think of heaven as a glorious city with jeweled walls and gates of pearl and streets of gold with nobody in it but angels, and they were all strangers to me. But after a while, my brother died. And then I thought of heaven as that beautiful place with one person there that I knew. And then he said another brother died. And then it wasn't long after that that several of his acquaintances and family members died. And he said, I began to feel I had more friends and family in heaven 
than I had down here on earth. And he said, now when my thoughts turn toward heaven, it's not the gold or the jewels or the pearls that I think of, but it is the loved ones who are there. It's not so much the place as it is the people that heaven has made beautiful to me. Heaven is also personal. I am admittedly my own worst enemy. I wonder if you ever feel like Paul did in Romans chapter 7, 24, when he said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You might have to understand that one of the ways that the Romans put people to death was chain them to a dead body. So that in times, the corruption of that body would also affect them and they would die. And so that's what Paul was talking about when he said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Maybe you feel like that sometimes. I know there are occasions when I have felt that way. But when we get up in the morning, we intend to be as Christ-like as we can be. We want to be as close to what God wants us to be as we possibly can, but sometimes this old world has a way of turning that around. And sometimes when evening falls, we can possibly be angry, maybe resentful, possibly even bitter. None of us want to be that way, and I'm sure if we feel that way at night, we say our evening prayer and ask God for forgiveness. I know a lot of times I have to say, God, forgive me, I sure messed up today. In heaven, we won't have that problem. In heaven, I can be a perfected me. There we will be free from the temptations and the sins of this old world. And we can be what I believe every one of us really wants to be, the best person that we can be. We want to be like Christ. We've already mentioned from 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, he tells us we're going to be like Christ. But also in Philippians 3 and verse 21, he tells us that when Christ comes again, that he will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body. We're going to have different bodies, but we're still going to be who we are. But we have an opportunity from that point on for eternity to be the best that we can possibly be. I don't know what heaven really means to you, but I hope you see heaven as God's home for us, home for the saved. But heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Little boy was making that comment, and he said, heaven is a prepared place for a repaired people. Well, both of those things are right, because you first have to be repaired before you can be prepared. And if you're repaired through becoming a child of God and having your sins washed away, then you can begin to make the preparation. My hope and prayer that each of us are looking forward to the time when we can go home and be with God. I hope you're making plans for that and that you're taking the necessary steps, making the preparation that will let you go home to heaven and see so many of your loved ones who have gone before. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You've been very kind. And I appreciate you inviting me back. It's been a while since I was here last, but I appreciate that. Thank you. I will close with a prayer unless somebody has an objection. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings, especially, Father, the blessing of prayer. The opportunity to know that we can come to you at any time or place that you do hear us, that you'll always answer us in keeping with your will and providence, but in ways that bless us. We ask special blessing upon this congregation, its elders, its deacons, its members. We just pray, Father, that you'll bless them as they continue to move on and to do 
your will in this place, in this church. We pray, Father, that you will continue to bless them in every conceivable way to grow not only in number, but also in spirit and in knowledge. Thank you, Father, most of all for Jesus, for the sacrifice he made for us and the hope that gives to us. Help us hold on to that. Look forward to the time when we can lay these old bodies aside and be able to go home and be with you. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.